The Bear Pit Session at Noma 2024. Some ministers have to depart right at 12 o'clock, so I'll get right to it. So welcome everyone, and thank you uh, all the ministers for coming to Thunder Bay. And uh, being with us for our annual Noma Conference in the Minister Forum. We're pleased that our delegates have had the opportunity to ask questions previously concerning our issues that we're facing in our region. So, I'm going to give a brief introduction to each minister. We've already met Minister Glenda and Minister Rickard. So I'll start with uh, Minister Dunlop, who is the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Jill has been a member of the Provincial Parliament for the Central North since 2018, and has served as the Minister of Colleges and Universities since 2021. Prior to being elected, Jill attended Western University and later joined the faculty of Jordan, Jordan College. Please welcome Minister Dunlop. And next, we have the Honorable Graydon Smith, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Graydon was first elected as a councillor for the town of Bracebridge in 2006 and elected mayor in 2010. He also served as the president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario before being elected as Ontario's Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and the member of provincial parliament for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Please welcome the Honorable Graydon Smith. Next, Honorable Lisa Thompson, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Lisa was first elected as the member of provincial parliament for Huron-Bruce in October 2011. On June 18, 2021, she was proudly appointed Ontario's 40th Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs by Premier Doug Ford. Please welcome Minister Lisa Thompson. Next, the Honorable Michael Parza was appointed Minister of Children, Community and Social Services by Premier Ford in March 2023. Previously serving as Associate Minister of Housing, he worked tirelessly to solve the housing crisis. He was first elected as a member of Provincial Parliament from Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill in June 2018. Michael is dedicated to improving the lives of vulnerable individuals and families and children in youth in both his community and across Ontario. Please welcome the Honourable Michael Hart. <laughs> last but not least, I'll just tear this one up because we had a talk. The Honourable Stephen Lecce. Stephen and I, uh, we have a fantastic relationship. We go back, way back, and Minister Lecce, uh, as you may be aware, was the PA for infrastructure a number of years ago. Stephen's looking a little tired, but uh, <laughs> we love you too, Fred. Bye yeah. now. So please welcome the Honorable Stephen Lecce, Minister of So get to it. We have a couple rules. So everyone obviously is in line already. So when asking a question, please state your name, the municipality you represent and identify the minister of whom you are addressing the question to. You will have two minutes to ask your question, and the minister will also have two minutes to respond. I do have control of the microphone, so you can be cut off at any time. So, we'll start on my right-hand side, and please state your name, and the minister you're addressing, please. Good afternoon, Wendy Landry, Mayor of the Municipality Union. But today, my hat is the uh, President of Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association. And my question is for my friend, Minister Calandra. Social and Economic Prosperity Review. AMO, as you know, called on the Premier to propose an update to the partnership between provincial and municipal governments to build sustainable communities, a solid foundation for economic growth and quality of life. The Social and Economic Prosperity Review would help to create a sustainable, accountable provincial and municipal relationship where both orders of government meet responsibilities. While we agree that this initiative over the last five years of Ontario and OMPF fund has remained static at 500 million, prior to that it decreased consistently for, since 2010 from a high of 650 million. The OMPF is the uh, province's main general assistance to grant municipalities and the program primarily supports northern rural municipalities across the province. Its objectives are to recognize the challenges of northern rural communities while targeting funding for those communities over the years. Has any thought been given to the increasing of this fund substantially helping the achieve social and economic prosperity for small and northern rural municipalities 
And additionally, will your government commit to undertaking the Association of Municipalities of Ontario a comprehensive social and economic prosperity review to promote promote the stability and sustainability of our municipal finances across Ontario, as the OFM, OMPF fund at times pits our municipalities against each other, where there's winners and losers. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, uh, uh, Wendy. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, look, I, they, we're taking a look at everything. How we uh, we we fund uh, uh, municipalities across the province of Ontario. One of the main goals of the province of Ontario is, of course, you, I want to highlight what you said at the end. Uh, pitting uh, communities against each other. It's about removing that, uh, those obstacles and that, uh, that dynamic. One of the reasons why when we've done the Building uh, Faster Fund, we've uh, separated and quit funds specifically for, uh, for Northern uh, Ontario because we understand that there are different challenges that uh, our Northern municipalities face. But I, I will say this, I was talking to, talked to many of you actually in this room. Uh, and I won't say which, which mayor, but uh, it really highlighted for me the challenges uh, that you face sometimes, and uh, explaining to me um, bridge construction that was needed in their community, uh, and the size of the community, and what that would mean to the, the tax base uh, in that community, just one bridge uh, in, uh, in that community. Uh, so we've, we're, we're very, very close to looking at it. It's why the, 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 the funds that we've announced, the infrastructure funds that, uh, that we are announcing, are always geared towards ensuring that um, that we're talking about infrastructure, not only sewer and water in the ground, but roads and bridges. So, look, we've announced the Building Faster Fund. In Bill 185, we're redirecting how uh, uh, the development charges, uh, uh, for instance, the new $1.8 billion uh, uh, that the Premier announced in infrastructure funds dedicated uh, towards uh, uh, Northern uh, Ontario. So, uh, as I said to Colin, who's here, we will take a look at that. We'll work together at the AMO board uh, with respect to uh, municipal financing uh, going uh, going forward, but also uh, very specifically on some of the very unique challenges that are faced by our, our northern municipalities. I know that's something that also Minister Rickford has has uh, talked about a lot, and uh, and also MPP uh, uh, Holland, former mayor, who who has been really instrumental in, in helping me understand a lot of those issues. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll get there together. Minister Holland, uh, sorry, MVP Holland, I just promoted you. <laughs> MVP Holland uh, held the OMPF so, fund uh, file uh, when he was part of our normal board, so I'm sure that he's uh, fully educating you on our concerns on that. Thank you. Very tenacious. Thank you. Thank you. My last Councillor Wendy Bernetta, Town of Fort Francis. This question is for Minister Rickford or any other minister that would like to comment. As you're aware, Minister Bereskin Airlines flights to Kenora, Fort Francis and Dryden will be discontinued May 11th due to a lack of demand. The withdrawal of Bereskin Airlines has threatened the viability of these northern airports, and this has made these airports ineligible for federal in, uh, airport capital assistance program funding, which was to be used to address specific capital needs, including runway rehabilitation. These airports provide service to multiple other carriers, including Orange, MNRF, and other private aircrafts. This will have a significant impact on Western Ontario economic and tourism opportunities. This will severely impact the municipality's ability to attract new industry and commercial enterprises. And maintaining a, sus a sustainable schedule of air transportation to these communities is key to the growth of emerging mining and green energy sector for the future. These airports also play a critical role in emergent health care and providing medical care supports. Will your government commit to providing financial support for a new carrier to provide reliable, affordable, convenient, scheduled passenger and freight air services to ensure the viability of these airports? Yeah, thank you for the question. Look, um, will we be in the business of uh, the government of Ontario Airlines? I, I, I don't think so. Um, but I can say, um, you know, I understand how consequential this is because my truck is parked in Winnipeg right now. Even the existing service uh, was inadequate. And um, uh, rather unfortunately, uh, the prices were out of reach. We have 80,000 people who leave um, uh, the Kenora and Rainy River districts every year for the Winnipeg airport. Um, and we know that, and so it can't be that even one-tenth of those, so 8,000 8, uh, uh, 
uh, passengers couldn't fly out of our, our region uh, as their point of departure. Um, look, uh, if the bus uh, analogy is, is any good example, and I know you've been you know, loud and clear in your appreciation for what we accomplished there, the Ontario Northland was a, a better uh, solution ultimately uh, when Greyhound moved off the main line. Uh, frankly, a the last couple of years, they were bringing people from Western Canada to Eastern Canada, and it wasn't really a service available to us unless they were uh, taking parcels. So we can play a role uh, as a government in that. We, I work very closely with the airport authorities uh, 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 to look at any and all opportunities to support a commercial airline re-establishing itself, one that's affordable and one that moves people not just around our riding uh, and region, but to other destinations. Some of those discussions are under, uh, underway, Wendy, but in the meantime, you have my assurances. In fact, I think I'm gonna be in Fort Francis next week or the week after to announce another major funding commitment to ensure that the Fort Francis Airport isn't going anywhere. And it will have all of the infrastructure that a modern airport needs, not just for safety, patient transportation, but for a future, I believe, when a commercial um, uh, airline company will understand the unique opportunity that they have in Northern Ontario and in Northwestern Ontario particularly, um, and we'll, we'll be ready for that. Okay? Jim Desmond, Ontario Airport but I'm here representing the NOMA Energy, uh, NOMA Combo Energy Task Force. My question is actually kind of open to either Minister Victor or Minister Smith. Two minutes? I don't know if I can get this. Anyway, anyway I'm just kidding. Start. This is actually a letter that we just received yesterday from the other Minister Smith, which is either your Minister of Energy. <coughs> in it, um, he has helped address one of the issues we've been fighting for here in the Northwest for 17 years and that is getting electricity to where it's needed. As everyone knows, we've got huge mining going on, and there have been several announcements about up in the Red Lake area which will help unlock uh, some massive uh, amounts of minerals that we will need, especially considering Honda just announced that they're gonna put an EV plant in, in 2028, uh, Ford said the same thing. There's a lot of it around uh, unique minerals beyond the gold. So in this letter, we have a commitment from Minister Smith to have the Wasigan line completed by 2027. So what that in effect does is that gets the energy to driving. The problem is it does not get the energy from driving up to Red Lake and to the area where it's needed. So my question to you two is really, can we get a commitment from the government to have the E4D and the ER2 circuits upgraded so that when 2027 rolls around, the energy can flow to where it's needed. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think we'll do our best to, uh, to understand that opportunity. Uh, uh, we have uh, quite recently and in the very near future, we'll be making a, num a number of announcements uh, for energy corridors that will support other energy corridors going into the north. So. Um, where is my buddy Mark here? So Greenstone, we, you know, we, we, we've got some exciting news uh, north of Red Lake uh, uh, on the horizon and um, that will require further energy support. I've got some experience in this, uh, uh, in this space, particularly when it comes to Red Lake. You might recall that um, in the absence of the t at the time of the provincial government um, upgrading uh, and fortifying the, the uh, lines there, we uh, moved ahead with natural gas uh, as, uh, as a great option for uh, the operation of, of the mine. So everything is on the table. Um, we think that uh, our road corridors have to be aligned with corridors that, that provide better broadband support uh, uh, and a better right of way for, uh, for, for energy. And I've had those conversations with Minister S uh, Smith and I think you'll find him open to those discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good morning. My name is Andrew Halgis, Mayor of the Town of Port Francis. My question is for the Honorable Graydon Smith, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. In border communities like ours, which share boundary waters with the United States, 
American fishing guides frequently take parties of American anglers who are accommodated in U.S. resorts directly into Canadian waters. This practice results in these anglers contributing no economic benefits to Canada while heavily utilizing our resources. This situation not only undermines our local fishing guides and tourism industries, but also negatively impacts our economy. Additionally, there is a significant need for improved enforcement of both provincial and federal statutes. Given that this issue affects Ontario residents directly, by straining our resources and economy. Could the provincial government commit to increasing enforcement in border waters, including checking working permits? And furthermore, will the provincial government pledge to collaborate with the federal government and American counterparts to swiftly resolve this situation? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question and uh, com completely uh, agree with your concerns. I mean, we, we take great pains to manage our resources here in Ontario, in, including our fish through a variety of fish management zones to make sure that it's there for uh, the people that uh, both live in Ontario and the people that come to Ontario and are contributing economically to uh, you know, what happens here. And we know coming off COVID has been a really difficult time for uh, a lot of uh, lodges and resorts and outfitters and, and communities. So uh, hear the concern uh, loud and clear. Uh, I know our conservation officers um, have been looking into it. Uh, I, I don't think that they've um, you know, kind of found anything, but I would qualify that with a yet. Uh, but certainly the commitment is there to continue to work with uh, not only uh, our, our conservation officers, but for them to work with international partners to make sure that everybody is playing by the rules, respecting international borders, respecting the resources that are here in Ontario for Ontarians to, to benefit Ontarians. So thank you for um, bringing the concern to the mic today. Uh, certainly one we share as well and uh, one that will be uh, looking into uh, even more than we already have. Thank you. But if I could just add to that, Andrew, sorry, did, did you want to? No, just thank yeah. the minister. Yeah, listen, um, I've spoken to, to the minister about this uh, because we've talked about it and I appreciate your, your leadership and we've heard from the business community that this is troubling not just in Rainy Lake, but Rainy River and frankly on Lake of the Woods. And we have stepped up monitoring through our conservation officers, but that's a little easier when, when ice fishing is going on. And the challenge, as I explained it to Minister Smith, is, is when the ice goes out and the season starts, you know, it's a little more difficult to capture these boats um, with uh, this. This is a post-COVID phenomenon. It's been going on a little bit more, but, but uh, there are two points to, to, to Graydon's intervention or response. Uh, you know, we will revisit a stepped up monitoring uh, come spring when the season opens, and um, uh, we will start to generate um, uh, documentation to uh, CBSA, uh, to your point about the work permit, because if they want to come over here with boatloads of American fishermen, uh, or fisher persons, whatever we call them now today, um, the, 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 the question is, what are you doing here, likely fishing illegally, and why are you working in Canada without a permit? I, the, the, the bottom line is to, is to shut it down. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm Councillor Hager from Municipality of Red Lake. Fred's my mayor, the moderator. Um, I'm also the Zone 10 rep for Roma, and the question is for Minister Dunlop. Um, this, actually, this morning we had a presentation on workforce planning, and one of the points was how can we retain the international students who are studying here? Well, we also need to have those people on the ground here if they're going to be retained. Um, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada recently announced major reforms mm -hmm. to the international student program that will have a significant impact in our local economies mm -hmm. and our communities. The IRCC has introduced a cap of 360,000 new permits for 2024. This is a 35% reduction from 2023. The economic impact of Lakehead University in Northwestern Ontario is 2.4 billion. In 2021, international student spending generated for, whoops, I've been cut off, it 
generated 14. I didn't cut you off. <laughs> it generated 14.5 million in added income for our regional economy. And active alumni, active, active alumni at Confederation College, College rather generated an additional 12.2 million. So this will. Uh, this will be a challenge because it's estimated it will result in a 50% reduction in international enrollment at Confederation College and Lakehead University, which will have a significant impact throughout the region. Question is, will you commit to participating in an open dialogue with NOMA, with Lakehead University, Confederation College, the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce, and other key stakeholders to explore solutions to recognize the unique challenges faced by institutions in northern regions and convince the IRCC to reconsider the current approach to capping international student permits? Well, Councillor, thank you for that question. And actually, to your right, I see Andrew Seekberg, the President of Tourism Industry Association of Ontario. And let me take you back to that day in January where Andrew and I were at Roma about half an hour after the announcement. And um, you know, before that, it was a unilateral decision made by the federal government. There was no consultation with the ministries, with the province, um, with the schools. I had a meeting with the minister on the Friday night before his Monday announcement. And you know that feeling of being kicked in the stomach and him telling us we were getting 50% reduction in the number of seats. And I said, okay, sorry, say that again. And is that, is that a hard number? He said, well, you know, we'll work with you. Um, announcement comes 8.30 on the following Monday morning. And I know when Andrew and I were speaking, it was like, what are we going to do? This is gonna have such a huge impact. And I said to him at the time and to many others in our chambers, we really need everyone to have a voice. It can't just be uh, the provinces and the schools advocating for the impact it's going to have on the schools, but what about the economic impact it's going to have in our, all of our regions, our provinces, and frankly, quite across Canada. Um, so we work with our schools and you know, one of the, um, the issues was the attestation letter, which is something that none of the provinces except Quebec was doing, which is uh, interesting, that's where the, uh, the federal minister comes from. And we were able to work with our schools and I had some great ideas come forward on platforms that we were already using to do um, acceptance letters. So this was actually you know, an easy step, but it was something that it was feedback from our schools and doing those consultations to better understand this process. Then we looked at, okay, how are we going to prioritize this? Because I wanted to ensure that it was across the board, it was a fair process, and we really need to focus on the labor market programs in all regions. And that's what we did. So we were able to go and look at all of the, the international enrollment in those labor market driven programs, and we were able to fill those numbers to complete. And so we actually, um, so the numbers you have, I think, were kind of the early predictions on what everyone thought was going to happen, but we were able to come up with a formula that had the least impact on the, the greatest amount of schools. So right here in Thunder Bay, we're actually going to see no change in the number of international students. But that is also because Lakehead and Confederation have also been very responsible in the way they have increased the number of international students in the way. So I see uh, the president of the Federation, Kathleen Lynch, here with us, and I want to thank her for the great work that she is doing in our in, in Thunder Bay and with the students and really meeting the needs of the uh, of this area. So you know we're focusing on skilled trades, on STEM, health, human resources, ECEs, um, but I can look at all of my ministry uh, colleagues here and the the labor shortages we have in all of our areas, and we're really gonna rely on those students. So my commitment moving forward, we're looking at, on a weekly basis, and we can do this with the attestation letter, is the number of applications that are coming into Ontario. We're already seeing a decrease, so it'll be interesting to see uh, where that lands. What has the federal government, in fact, done to uh, decrease the reputation of Canadian post-secondary education around the world? So we will continue to work with the federal government because I believe that there could be an opportunity to receive more allocations for uh, next, uh, for 2025, but we'll continue to work with them. And I think they're going to, in fact, see the impact that it's having across Canada. So I'll continue to advocate for post-secondary in all regions of Ontario. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks for your effort. So, thank you. We will have 24 minutes left, so I'm gonna ask for very quick questions and very quick responses. Okay, good morning.
My name is Dan McGrath. I'm the counselor for the municipality of Scriber. And my question is for Minister Calambra. Uh, Scriber and other northwestern Ontario communities have been directed by the federal government to eliminate chlorine from the effluent of our wastewater facilities, and the deadline is the end of 2026. The cost of this change will be between one and two million dollars, and funding opportunities have not been made available from the federal or provincial governments, except for projects enabling housing. Some of our communities are in a zero or negative growth phase at this time, and cannot access housing enabled funding. Our question is, how do we maintain existing water, wastewater infrastructure in our communities and fulfill regulatory requirements without government assistance? Will your government provide funding opportunities for existing infrastructure Asking for communities not qualify for housing enabled funding? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the tail end of it. Yeah, look, look you, you, you hit the nail on the head. And it's, I, let me just say this. I know nobody wants to, to hear different levels of government uh, arguing with each other. We all have the same goals that we should have in mind, but I can't tell you how, how frustrating it has become. Uh, one of the reasons I talked about the national housing strategy and the change in, in how they are doing things, it impacts you. That means more money has to come from somewhere else. The housing accelerator. There are not many, Thunder Bay, I think maybe Marathon, you, those are the two communities that have access to the housing accelerator uh, uh, fund. Uh, the changes that they're contemplating on, uh, on their infrastructure uh, will not allow certain things like that to be funded. This is why we are so frustrated, not only the province of Ontario, but all of us. Every province across this, this country is frustrated and annoyed because they're changing the rules of the game as they go and they're picking winners and losers, and they're picking regions against each other. What we have said to the federal government, we've been very clear, we need infrastructure. We are asking Northern Ontario to participate in ever greater than they ever have before. Your prosperity here is what will lead to prosperity in Southern Ontario and across the country, and that's why we've been focused on water and sewage uh, and the other important things like roads and bridges. Our infrastructure programs have been focused on that and we have been saying to the federal government, partner with us on those things. Partner with us on the things that we can agree upon because this is what our partners are asking us to do. Um, and this is why we have said, I'm not going to negotiate from Queen's Park uh, on behalf of all 444 municipalities we are doing a Team Ontario approach so that we can go back to the federal government and say, this is what Ontario's priorities are. We're starting that next week. Uh, uh, and <coughs> we have programs of $1.8 billion, of $1.120 million. It is focused on sewer, water, infrastructure, roads, bridges, $2 billion for, uh, for, for schools, hospitals. Uh, we hear you and we're going to fight for you. I know you don't want to hear us fighting with each other, but if we don't, there is so much that you will not have access to. It frustrates me to no end when people say, well, the Housing Accelerator Fund. Great. How many of you have access to the Housing Accelerator Fund here? Put your hand up if you have access to the Housing Accelerator Fund. Call in your Milton so I don't include you. Uh, <laughs> right? We have to wrap up this. So I'm sorry, if you get me going, we'll talk about it more because I 100% agree, and this is why we're going to stand up for you. It's why we don't, want to, we don't want to fight, but we will on behalf of the 444 municipalities in this province that aren't being supported in the way that they should be. Thank you. Questions brief, please. Thank you. 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 So across Northwestern Ontario, there's a significant challenge for families to access affordable child care and securing child care workers remains difficult. Do you have a plan to address these shortages and provide investment to secure more licensed affordable child care and child care workers throughout the region? Okay, thank you very much for the question, uh, Fred. Good morning and thank you for that curious introduction. <laughs> uh, that's not what we discussed for the record. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate the question, and I just want to say uh, I got to know uh, Olivia and Vito, who are here, the student trust, student representatives. Uh, both of you are, you are all student trust counselors. You're very impressive. 
it's amazing to see the next generation step up. So good for you. Now, I don't want to be presumptuous and maybe a little early for childcare for you, <laughs> but it's a fair point because we need childcare. So what do we do? Uh, we cut a deal. So Paul just talked about when you have to work with and you already have to fight with or, or advocate with levels of government. We got to yes with the federal government on this deal, but we had to fight hard. We had to stand up for our communities and for respecting the di different choices parents made. Nonprofit, for profit, community based, home based, all of those solutions have to be part of it. If we want to build childcare, reduce wait lists, and actually get more women in the economy, we've got to give the option of all of the above to parents. And the federal government really took an ideological position of only nonprofit childcare. But the truth is, in many of your communities, some of them only have for profit childcare. And we're not talking, these aren't Walmarts, folks. These are women who run small businesses, often one, perhaps two operations. We have to support them all, and we are. And that's important as a first principle. The second is how do we get the ECs, the staff, to fill the spaces? We announced a plan to increase wages by 19% this year alone. Every year, we're gonna increase wages by $1 per hour per year. And what we've achieved this year, in the first year of our increase, um, was that we created wage parity with the ECs in the kindergarten program, because the school boards will pay them more, for pensions and benefits, et cetera, than the, you know, the nonprofit or the for-profit childcare. So this created wage parity. And so we ended that delta that moved a lot of ECs from our, school, from our childcare system into our schools. So that's all part of the plan. We're working together, Jill and I, uh, on dual credits, expanding the ability of young people to take their EC placements in high school, and the courses in high school count towards their college diploma. So we're doing a whole multitude of actions here, but the big takeaway, I think, for families in the North is we have cut fees for families in your communities by anywhere between six and $10,000 per child per year. And I can't think of a way a government could put more funding in the pockets of working people than that. That's good point. So we're proud of that. We're gonna keep cutting fees. We're gonna keep building spaces in Northern Ontario. I was just with Kevin Holland yesterday. We announced uh, a new school um, in Marathon, a uh, French school, a child care expansion is happening across the north. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep working together. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Moffat. I'm the mayor of Manitowoc. Uh, my question is for Minister Rickford and or Minister Smith. Um, Ontario wants to be the world leader in mining of EV. Uh, EVs, building EVs, they want people to buy EVs. Why would people want to buy EVs in Ontario, especially Northern Ontario, when it is presently unsafe to travel with them in the winter? Why, you ask? Because no one is holding the owners of the existing EV chargers responsible for the dependability of their chargers. EV batteries drop 40% at minus 30. So until there are enough chargers and enough dependable chargers on our northern highways, they are unsafe to travel with for at least four months of the year. I consider myself one of the Northern Ontario pioneers for EVs. I've had mine for three years, and I have not seen any improvements on our highway for that infrastructure. Yeah, I think we addressed this last year. Um, uh, this exact question on uh, the, the biggest problem being uh, having the same kind of charger uh, for all electric vehicles. So it was being built out based on Tesla or some other uh, piece where that, that was incompatible. So that, so that, was, the first, uh, that was the first piece. Um, so I think we've made some progress uh, in, in those regards. Uh, I, I can't um, reach in and change the, uh, uh, the the capacity of those batteries to go farther, as you as you well know. Um, but I think that um, you know I've had this discussion with Vic, a northerner in his own right, um, that uh, you know, we're not going to be able to to do this unless the collective efforts uh, of the federal government and the provincial government align on um, uh, streamlining the the. Um, yeah, I don't know what it's called, you know, the hookup for, for it so that it fits all cars. Um, uh, and that's precisely why I drive a gas-powered pickup truck right now, because I don't own a Tesla, I can't afford one, um, for starters, but, but I've only got one option heading to Winnipeg where I fly out of, and that's, that's a Tesla. 
So we still have some, some challenges there. That's a, a commercial problem as much as it is a government problem. But I'll circle back with you directly on, on some specifics uh, uh, offline here. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Thank you. Hello, I am Olivia Kemble. I am the student counselor for the municipality of Shunya, and my question is to Minister Parsa. Um, we've heard a lot over the last few years on the province's role on changing social assistance, commonly known as Ontario Work. On Ontario Works, could an update be given on the work of modernizing social assistance and how the ministry is ensuring better outcomes will be had for clients in Northern Ontario communities by taking advantage of Northern Ontario opportunities? Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah, thanks very much for the question, and uh, Your Worship, thank you for a great job and so many uh, familiar faces. I, I have to start off by answering that by uh, giving a shout out to the local member here, <coughs> Kevin Holland, because upon my uh, election, uh, right after the 2022 election when I was appointed to cabinet, within hours, MPP Kevin Holland approached me and said, Minister Parcel, back then I was the Associate Minister of Housing, and he said, you will have, in Queen's Park, you will hear a lot of uh, issues and challenges. When you come to the north, you will get a lot of solutions. And, and he was right. Every single time that I've been here, and this is now my fifth time here in Thunder Bay, uh, and that's been, it's been exactly that. And, and, and the reason I mention that is because I want to thank you, uh, so many of the partners that are here. We have a working table that meets every two weeks. The, the social assistance program, as you know, we have two programs. We have the Ontario Disability Program, which is a long-term support being provided to those with disabilities. And we have Ontario, which is a short-term support provided to individuals to get them connected back to employment, higher paychecks. And as you recall from the Auditor General's report, the system wasn't working. We needed to, to work together to improve that to make sure that people have the supports that they need. When I came up here and I had a meeting with uh, MPP Holland, uh, Mark and Henry were, were at that meeting, we heard it was it was quite clear that the current system wasn't working, which is why uh, on, we put in solutions in place in partnership with municipalities and DSAPs to make sure that the supports that they need on their ground, many of the caseworkers were spending hours and hours on paperwork. They were individuals who were coming into these offices spending eight hours, nine hours a day to be able to fill up paperwork and then have that fair information verified. That's not acceptable. What our vision in partnership with a lot of you, you the part of the municipalities and DSAP, is to make sure that the supports that are needed on the ground are offered to the people. And that's why we have this vision of, an, of a, a social assistance program that puts people back on the path of prosperity through our initiatives to make sure that these the supports that they need, whether it's mental health support, whether it's employment support, those are available to the individuals on the ground. And uh, I know that we've made inroads through the digitization because we've already seen so we've already seen some of the results of that, but the work is ongoing. We've got some work to do and we're gonna get there. And that means making sure that the supports that are needed on the ground are offered by caseworkers to make sure that they're not spending hours and hours and hours on paperwork and spend those time with the individuals who need that. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Welcome, Minister. Lisa Teagle, Councillor Emo, Green River District. My question is for Minister Thompson. Nice to see you again. As a beef producer in our district, we understand the use of anger stability and risk management programs. How can us, as producers, work with OMAFRA to increase and enhance those programs to create a stable industry, especially with the needs that we have with climate change, excess moisture, excess drought, excess heat, let alone the carbon um, tax problems? And, and, and would you work with our producers? Yeah. Thank you. Minister? Thank you very much, and I appreciate the question very much. And the short answer is yes, I will work with farmers in Northern Ontario because we need to make sure that we support you when it comes to managing risk. Because we heard earlier this morning, by the way, I'm so proud of Chloe, beautiful job in talking about agriculture is, is economic as well. And with that, we need to make sure that if we're going to maintain a workforce where in Northern Ontario, the egg and food industry is the second largest employer, we need to make sure that the farmers have all the supports at home as well. 
And so to that end, you'll be pleased to know, just yesterday morning, I met with the Ontario Agricultural Sustainability Coalition, of which Ontario Beef is a big player. And we're talking about that very thing. You know, the fact of the matter is, Ontario farmers are doing an amazing job increasing production. And we need to think about that value add. Ladies and gentlemen, 40% of all beef produced in Ontario actually gets exported. And we talked about the importance of, you know, accessing those markets. And so good on you for doing that. That said, cost of production's going through the roof. And I am so proud to share that 25 agriculture and food organizations co-signed a letter with me, with me that we took to the federal level saying, stop the tax. It's killing farmers in terms of cost of production. Secondly, thank you very much. And our premier stands right beside us. You'll also be pleased to know that we know in order to continue to grow, that risk management program that you alluded to needs to scale and grow with production as well. And just a footnote as I close up, um, at March Madness, it, which is hosted by Grain Farmers of Ontario, Premier Ford spoke to the chair, Jeff Harrison, and said, I know we need to do something about the risk management program to reflect the importance and the growth that we've experienced in the industry. So I say stay tuned. We're on it. Thank you. Here, here. Stay tuned. Stay on. Questions? We've got eight minutes. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Sawyer Redden. I'm a student counselor for the Town of Marathon. And uh, my question is for Minister Thompson as well. Uh, the rising cost of food prices across northwestern Ontario has put a strain on many families' budgets, especially lower income families who will continuously have to make difficult decisions on where to spend their hard earned money. As a result of this rise in food prices, especially for healthy and nutritious options. Uh, families are struggling and often choosing lower quality foods that are often cheaper, but more likely to result in adverse health outcomes later in life, which will ultimately cost our communities more and lead to lower quality of life in those individuals. Uh, these multi-billion dollar food corporations are raking in profits and downloaded their increased costs to their consumers so they do not have to compromise on their bottom line profits, all while many of our residents struggle to make ends meet. What is your ministry doing to address the rising cost of food and ensuring all people across Northwestern Ontario have equitable access to affordable and nutritious food? Thank you. Minister? Sawyer, thank you so much for that question and congratulations on being a junior counselor. I can tell you at home, we don't have those roles, but I'm going to take that inspiration that then your entire panel offered this morning and hopefully clone it and make sure we have young voices at our municipal tables as well. So kudos back to you. With regards to the price of food, the number one thing we can do is stop the carbon tax. Honest to goodness, it is absolutely eroding people's ability to buy good quality food, every single link of that supply chain. Earlier this morning we heard though, in Northern Ontario, 40% of food consumption, actually uh, production, stays local. So you're consuming local foods. And I smiled at that because I thought, well, there's one way to cut down on the carbon tax because you don't have the same cost of transportation that some of, some of us have at home. For instance, in my neck of the woods where we produce milk, that milk has to travel five, six hours to Eastern Ontario to get processed. So, you know, good on all of you for recognizing the importance of local. In terms of the, the price or the retail price at the shelf that you see, we're working collectively as a team of provincial ministers across Canada to address an issue that continues to be paramount in terms of priorities, and that is the grocery code of conduct. And I want Thank everyone you, in the... Sir. Okay, Steve. I'm sorry, just very quickly, because it's a very important point. Um, just a few months ago, uh, Minister Lecce and I increased the student nutrition program last school year yeah. by $1.5 million so that no student is hungry in our school and no one's left behind. And this year, we added an additional $5 million to the student nutrition program and the First Nations student nutrition program. And, and I wrote a letter to my federal counterpart. I'm happy that in the recent budget, they have announced that they will be working with us to making sure that no one actually is left behind, that the students are receiving that support. That came in partnership with Minister Lecce. So the student nutrition program 
program has received funding now to $38 million across the province. Currently, land acquisitions take approximately two years. Talking to local MNRF officials, they indicate that this is going to be a review for shortening the process for municipalities. Has there been any review started, and if so, are there any updates? Yeah, so uh, good news on that front, and thanks very much for the question. Uh, I'm really excited that we've created a Crown Land Disposition Task Team, so we now have dedicated individuals within the ministry to make sure that these dispositions can happen faster. Listen, uh, you know, I've walked that mile in, in everyone's municipal shoes here, and I've uh, been a community leader that wanted to build and build and grow a community, but you can only do that if you have, uh, you know, the available land to do it, and we know that Crown Land is part of that solution. Uh, I've talked with Minister Calandra on, on on multiple occasions and Minister Rickford about the opportunities in Northern Ontario for communities to grow and you know as economic development uh, continues to expand in all these communities uh, and we want to be able to, to, to help facilitate everyone taking advantage of that so through the task team it's a recognition that small communities only have so much capacity to do this work and if we create red tape and create uh, a back and forth back and forth back and forth conversation where we're constantly asking for things uh, and expect that municipalities just have the capacity to go and get it done and, and get that answer and it'll all happen, we'll never get there. So the task teams are there specifically to provide that help, provide that support, uh, both to municipalities and Indigenous communities, uh, making sure that these, these transactions, which are incredibly important for the growth of small municipalities and municipalities, frankly, all throughout Northern Ontario, uh, can happen. Uh, so uh, they're in place. The work is underway. We've had some outreach from uh, some municipalities already, but I know that the interest is there. So I'd really encourage the conversations uh, between any interested municipality uh, and the local district office to make sure that we can formalize and understand what the ask is, where it is, and get to work on providing that help. Because we want to back you up and let you grow your communities and thrive and, and uh, you know build housing and, and expand and do all those good things. Thank you, Minister Smith. Thank you. Unfortunately, due to time, this will be our very last question, if we can keep it in two minutes. Okay, I'm going to do my best. Okay, Eric Beach Council for Municipality Greenstone. This is for Minister Smith. With the shutdown of the mill in Terrace Bay, a whole region has been impacted with job losses, not only in the mill, but also over 200 jobs lost in Greenstone. The Crown Forest forced to basically shut down and the forest access roads are not being maintained. These roads are not just used for forestry, but are vital for the economic development in our region, such as tourism and recreation. To part question, I do apologize. What will your government do to help get the activity and economy forest back up and running to benefit the people of the region? And B, what will your government do to help ensure, at the very least, the primary roads in the Kanagami Forest are being maintained, given their overall public benefit? Thank you. Thanks very much for the question, and I'll, Fred, I'll try and be, be relatively brief in the answer. Uh, you would have heard me speak about both these things to some degree yesterday, but I'll just elaborate a little bit more. So specifically, and I'll start with the roads first, when it comes to the roads, we know absolutely how important they are, not only you know in your area, but all throughout the north. The forest access roads serve multiple purposes uh, and allow people to you know get a lot done more than just providing access to um, the forestry operations that go on. So it's very much a high priority for us. Uh, we've been having lots of conversations with lots of municipalities uh, and uh, good news is coming. Uh, if you can just uh, hang on uh, another couple of days, uh, I'm very excited about an announcement that I'm going to make um, next week. Specific to your area, I know that uh, the challenges of, of travel and, and the use of uh, those roads in particular uh, are, are one of high importance, so I've asked my staff to uh, look into that more deeply uh, so we can get some, some options and, and think about how best to tackle that. Because to the first part of your question, we know that the idling of the Milton Terrace Bay has you know, ramifications not only in that community, but in a wide range of communities for a variety of reasons that, that you've highlighted. So you know, the other thing that we want to do, of course, is see that mill up and running again. And I spoke yesterday uh, with uh, both uh, municipal leaders in Terrace Bay and, and well beyond and other stakeholders, um, you know, including uh, First Nations uh, and workers and, and frankly a number of interested municipalities because of 
the integrated uh, issue of forestry to make sure that um, you know we're hearing the messages from folks on the ground and the status of what's happening on the ground and we're doing the very very best we can to uh, get that mill open again whether it's with an, an existing owner or a new one. Fred, can I just add very quickly, and thanks for this question, look, this is also a northern development opportunity for us. Uh, we recognize the strategic importance of those roads, that corridor, and where uh, it's going to lead to, and I can assure you that all of the commitments, especially the ones that the Premier and I announced uh, up there not long ago with respect to forestry training, we, we see the opportunity on the horizon uh, for forestry and mining in the region and that's why we will be maintaining the funding through the Heritage Fund and any other programs at, at skills trade capacity for First Nations communities and community members uh, in that area. None of that's going away. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I'm inviting up our NOMA president, Wendy Landry, for some closing words. And I'd like to thank all of the ministers for, for attending Thunder Bay today, being part of our conference. It's much appreciated by our board. Thank you so much.